Hello and welcome to our Gold Learning viewers. I'm Fiona Lang Sharp, IBCLC Director of Communications here at Gold Learning. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. James McKenna, and he is going to be with us at our Gold Perinatal Conference. And we're going to be talking with him just in a moment here. But uh, before we get started, I just want to give you an opportunity to go to that website right now, goldperinatal.com, and have a look at what's coming up. But most importantly, check out the dates for our closing keynote, um, and that will be with Dr. James McKenna, and he is going to be with us on Monday the 29th. That is open access and free to everyone, our gift to you, and we're looking forward to seeing some of you there. So. We'll talk again about that at the end of this uh, little interview here, but it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Dr. James McKenna. Welcome here, Jim, to Gold Perinatal. Oh, thank you, Fiona. It's great to be here. I'm excited about the presentation and any engagement I might be able to stimulate will be terrific. Uh, all of us know what a remarkably complex and yet interesting and beautiful subject I have been privileged to study for the last 30 years, um, ever since my son came into our lives and showed me that there are really some amazing conflicts between what culture does with respect to defining what normal care for babies might be and what their biology suggests would be more ideal. But I've had the privilege, as you know, for many years to run the first mother-baby behavioral sleep lab in the world and I uh, had the privilege of working with hundreds and and perhaps at this point, thousands of babies. What a wonderful career. Well, I know for sure, Jim, that you've touched the lives of thousands, hundreds of thousands of families um, through not only your, your work in person, but also uh, your online website um, and through your book, which, um, you know, if no one has seen that book before, that's something that you definitely want to to uh, to have a look at. And we'll talk more about that uh, just in a minute here. You can give people details on that and, um, and what's coming up. But first of all, um, you know, Jim, tell us a little bit about your day to day life. I'm just curious and all that you do. I know that your life's work has been, you know, in this area. But what does your day to day life look like right now? And perhaps you want to share a little bit about what that looks like and where you are in the world. Well, what a great question. Well, what do I do every day? I also have the privilege of engaging with young people. Uh, I must admit that as wonderful as my research has been and, and as rewarding as it's been, as well as frustrating sometimes and challenging, I have the absolute utmost privilege of teaching young, bright students. And of course, I do everything I can to corrupt them to the ways of understanding mothers and babies and breastfeeding and birthing and co-sleeping. And that part of my life is probably what I derive the absolute most satisfaction from. It's so relational and you, as was true for me, you can be that person that makes it possible for people to achieve their dreams and in the process become enriched by the wonders of nature and the wonders of the anthropological perspective that I am able to offer and was offered to me. I find it a discipline, believe it or not, that isn't really just a discipline. It's kind of a, a lifestyle. You, you get such powerful, unique, enriched insights as to who we are as human beings and how we can conceptualize ourselves from across cultural and ethnographic, a evolutionary, a developmental, um, and a cross-species perspective. And I've had the, the good luck of coming across this amazing field and sharing those insights. And I, as I say, I, I think it's much more of a way of life and a way of understanding than it is simply a discipline to be studied. So um, at the moment, I'm actually kind of moving out into the field. I think I've done just about every laboratory physiological behavioral study we can do. Right. So I'm going into people's homes now and asking questions, doing some ethnographic research, which makes them decide on one form of feeding or one feed of, uh, one kind of sleeping arrangement than some other, and talking with parents and understanding and giving meaning more meaning to the physiological and the behavioral studies we've, you know, conducted through the years where we indeed look at what's going on in between the mother and baby wherever they're sleeping, but particularly when they're together. 
in the sense of, you know, sleep architecture issues and breastfeeding, how it's affected by the proximity of the mother. So I'm rounding out at this, I guess you'd have to say, tail end of my career, um, putting a added meaning on to all of these studies I've done from a physiological and behavioral point of view. And I'm finding that, uh, you know, incredibly rewarding and valuable with respect to giving my work more meaning. Absolutely. Well, I, in listening to you just now, I'm just thinking about all the things that I personally have learned over the years from you and um, studying your material in your book, but there, there, you always bring it to this uh, complete simplicity of human life and nature and nurturing, but yet it's so intricate in um, in all the detail that you've been able to extrapolate from, you know, the research and, you know, and, and, and needed. I mean, it, it's, it's so needed because I know that we've been um, really diverted on a, a very dangerous course, you know, throughout this, this century and uh, with how um, things have been skewed and presented in yes. a manner that have just really um, been fear-based and have not been truths as well, which is another element that I know, um, and, and I'm sure you'll talk about this because I, I hear it yes. from you as well. And, <laughs> right. Um, but I, 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 there is an appreciation for this uh, simplicity, but yet the intricacies that are taking place with, um, you know, with the human body and, uh, and, and, and in that dyad um, that we see of the, the mother baby dyad and in that newborn yes. face. So uh, once again, you know, there, there is always things that I am, I'm hearing and I'm learning from you. And I, and I, that, ma that makes you just uh, so elevated in our field and the fact that you've been able to stick it out. I mean, if, let's just say it out loud. You know, yes, Dr. Indeed. James McKenna has stuck it out and, um, and made this his life's work. And, and now, you know, making that little shift. That that's exciting to hear, uh, you know, Jim, that you're, you know, that you're shifting a little bit too. Um, was this, was, was it spurred on by something? What, what was, uh, what was going on? What, what was, uh, drove you to, to make that little shift to be in the homes? Was there more research that you were looking at? Well, you know, what's interesting is the only major critique of my work, and I must admit, even fighting uphill battles and fighting against currents of all kinds, I've never actually had a paper rejected, and I didn't even realize that till one of my colleagues just asked me that outright. How many papers have you had rejected, Jim? And I, I go, oh my gosh, I don't think any. Right. And you know what that speaks to? It doesn't speak to me. It speaks to the power of this biology. And people at the same time that they're critiquing, critiquing it, they're amazed by it. And I guess if, if I can point to anything that, that has made me shift gears a little bit, it's to respond to this critique. There's nothing I can do about, yes, it isn't the home. I know there are perturbations that go on in a home that I can't replicate in, you know, my somewhat apartment-like laboratory. I put that sure. little word phrase in there because it is like an apartment. It wouldn't, it doesn't look like a lab. It's bedrooms and kitchenettes and a big shower. So the parents or whoever is in there has a run of the place, you know, and we, we do have <laughs> embedded little infrared cameras, of course, which they're aware of, not in the shower, mind you, but, you know, yeah. in the bedrooms and such. Sure. But yeah. um, but it, it is something that one can't escape from. So, you know, nowadays, the, actually, even the physiology, the act, what's called actigraphy, you don't need these big cumbersome sleep machines with you know, people being all wired up and, and so on and so forth, which was part of polysomnography. Now you can put a little thing on the wrist and get heart rate and blood pressure and oxygen saturation. So Meteor the ability yeah. to even conduct the courses in homes has been revolutionized that you you really are in the home environment now and able to get the physiology, et cetera. And the other thing, you know, in case anyone would be interested, the work is stretched out to foragers, hunters, and gatherers. You know, one of my comparative baselines has always been, you know, the context within which infant sleep and mother-infant relationships evolved and emerged. And that has always been in a hunting-gathering society where we're bringing the equipment out to areas of um, Uganda and Tanganyika, and we're getting physiological measurements in the environments within which infants sleep evolved. And I'll have a couple of papers coming out on looking at hosta foragers and what we're learning about the actual context within which we think um, at least modern sleep uh, comes the closest 
to um, being revealed in the sense right. of what how it contrasts with um, how our contemporary environments change not only our understanding of it but how it finds expression yeah it's all i mean it's so fascinating to hear you just talk in that area now and how things and and again how things have really improved for us to really look at the research again and differently and um but yet we're still seeing a lot of the same results. I mean, the things that mm -hmm. you knew, um, it's just becoming uh, easier and I, I guess better to to read in some terms um, for right. those that didn't, uh, you know, didn't appreciate or understand it right now. All right. So I, I know you and I, we could we could talk about this all day. And and of course, Indeed. we will. We will get a chance to yes. do that because uh, you're going to be here with us at Gold. Um, and so for our closing keynote, which will be on. Uh, Monday, the 29th of October, that's going to be for, for most people around the world, uh, but you need to go to the website and check it out because for some of the uh, southern hemispheres, it'll be on a different day. So we want to make sure that we get everybody in um, who's interna our international audience in for the So now that we just have a couple of minutes left, I just want to ask you um, if uh, you can share a little bit about uh, this presentation and perhaps just give us a couple of things that you're really um, excited about sharing or you want people just to be able to take away, okay? Okay. Well, before I do that, I have to tell you a little anecdote that is related to what I want to share with the audience and what I'm really very excited about at the moment. So. It's a few years ago, the Australian Breastfeeding Association had invited me to talk. And as one does when it's giving a lecture to a large number of people, you review, of course, and you consider the lecture and study your notes and all these good things. So shortly after, I fell asleep and I had a dream about my lecture. Somebody asked me in the dream, what would I be lecturing on? And I said, oh, I'm going to be talking or I wanted to say in the dream, I will be talking about breastfeeding in the context of co-sleeping. But in the dream, something else came out. When they asked me, I had a slip of the tongue and I said, oh, I'll be talking about breast sleeping. And I go, oh my gosh, this voice came on. Oh my gosh, Jim, that's really good. You got to wake up and write that down. That is a very good word. So I actually did and I wrote it down and my first slide had a word in it that I never even had thought about before that I showed the audience. I said, am I crazy here or is this a really pretty good word? And the whole audience jumped up and applauded. And I said, OK, <laughs> you answered that question. How do you like this? I'm going to be a lecture on breast sleeping. Well, Excellent. yes, and I am excited about that, Fiona, because I do think that it, it actually is a very critical intellectual kind of insight to use that term because it suggests the reality of the fact that there really is no such thing as maternal, normal maternal infant sleep or infant sleep or breastfeeding patterns without understanding the functional interdependence of all of those components and domains such that mother sleeps in a certain way because she's breastfeeding and because the baby is next to her, obviously, and the baby sleeps a particular way and feeds in a particular way because that baby is in proximity and contact with the mother. And thus, mm -hmm. I think the advantage of, and I'll be arguing this in the lecture, it, it comes to us the advantages in all kinds of ways, one of which is it's different. And people hear it and they go, oh, well, what's breast sleeping? I say, ah, that's an epidemiological new category I hope to propose, where in the context of the absence of all known independent risk factors like prone sleep, maternal smoking, other children in the bed, in the absence of those factors, it's a breastfeeding mother sleeping in some way either in proximity or on the same surface with their baby. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we can justify that is when that is the context, all of the variables shift clinically to what is beneficial for the baby and for the mother. And this is to be contrasted very much and separated from, as I'll be explaining the reason why, from bed sharing in the context of formula or cow's milk feeding. Very right. different numbers, very different clinical expression. So I'm most excited about that and I hate to have to always be critiquing the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, but I'm going to really directly 
uh, inform and teach the audience what constitutes evidence-based medicine from the father of evidence-based medicine himself, David Sackett, and look one by one at the components of the recommendations made and the process by which they're made by the American Academy of Pediatrics to prove that they are not evidence-based as they claim. So, uh, you know, mostly my lecture is going to be very positive, but we're going to go into the evolutionary, the political, the cross-cultural, the cross-species um, research that all together basically legitimizes this new concept called breast sleeping. Well, that to me sounds fabulous. I, I, I just listening in and taking in all your words and language once again, uh, reminding me of my deep, deep hunger, you know, to, to see this be successful with all of our families because that's I'm on the I'm boots on the ground with these families yes, and are. so yep. you know I I you know I'm I'm preaching a lot of this I'm I'm able to do that because I am in private practice but I know how challenging it is for my cohort of oh, yes. co-workers that are um, behind the lines so to speak right. um, and within the system and the challenges that they face um, but some of them just actually don't have the information and I think going through some of the things that you mentioned uh, that you'll be addressing again you know always excellent uh, to have a perspective on what is evidence-based because I know for not just yourself uh, Jim but there are many people who uh, will dispute that some of the information that we read even though it says evidence-based it's not yes. so we really need to be careful um, before we throw that language out there um, into the mix of our of our medical field that we're actually not just alluding to but we're actually looking at it uh, in, a, in real terms of what of what our founding fathers uh, in, intention and know, know of it to be evidence-based. So wonderful. Gosh, just so many good things. I mean, what can we say? It's always Thanks, a pleasure Janet. having you. Uh, so, uh, okay, so uh, lastly, let's. I'm going to wrap this up now, Jim, because I uh, you know, your presentation is uh, free and open access uh, oh, to great. everybody in the world. Isn't that fantastic? I mean, that so is. nobody has an excuse not to come. Uh, everybody should be listening to this. So this is wonderful. We're able to do that through our gold perinatal platform uh, where people will have an opportunity to come to the full conference, of course. Um, but if they choose to, they can come and listen to you um, open access, which is just fantastic. So again, uh, go to the website right now. Uh, we'll be promoting it now for the next few weeks. Uh, October's right around the corner, so mark it on your calendar as Monday the 29th of October. Uh, Dr. James McKenna will be here with us live, which uh, also is very exciting because I'll have the opportunity to chat with him a couple of times um, and also do some great interviews as well, ask questions on behalf of you in real time. Now, if you can't make it on that day, uh, I want you to know that we will be recording this session as well, which is fabulous. So, so for all of you who are perhaps working that day or busy with family life, uh, it will be recorded you'll have the opportunity to register and come back and listen to it over and over again, <laughs> which which might be necessary because I know that uh, Jim has a tendency to jam pack his presentations. Um, and so you'll, uh, and he'll, really? be, he'll be sending out lots of research for you as well. So there'll probably be homework uh, as well. So he'll Indeed. want and direct you to certain areas uh, that you'll need to go back and have a look at. So great opportunity for just uh, really diving into this uh, fabulous topic, uh, breast sleeping. Gosh, what a great terminology. And um, so we'll look forward to seeing you there. Goldperinatal.com. Uh, register online for this free and open access Monday the 29th if you can make it for the live event. Thank you so much, Jim. You're so much fun too to work with. Oh, thank you, Fiona. I think you should book yourself in for a lecture. You're as good as anybody here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. You're so sweet. I'm looking forward to uh, having you back with us. And, uh, and to our listening audience, thanks for joining us today. And we'll look forward to having you back on the live day. Bye-bye for now, everyone.